seems to be missing something. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Mary Mancusi. Um, I am this is my eleventh Dragon Con, which is pretty cool. Um, I have written a lot of different books, uh, mostly sci-fi, fantasy uh, for adults, teens, and most recently middle grade, which is not middle school, just so you know. That's like the eight to twelve range. So I um, work for Disney, and uh, I did a King Arthur time travel that just came out last year. And my new book with them is a gaming book. Um, it's called Dragon Ops. I actually have a poster because I brought it from the other panel. Uh, and the idea of Dragon Ops is that uh, the world's first augmented reality theme park has opened up on an island. And these kids get to go and get a sneak peek because their uncle works on the game. And when they're in the game, well, as you do, you get trapped in it uh, by a rogue AI dragon who's determined to win the game at any cost. And they have to fight their way through uh, the game with some real life stakes. So it was really fun to write. I am a gamer. I'm a geek. And just going into creating this world was really fun for me. Hi, um, I'm Michael Chatfield. I've got about 30 or so books from science fiction, fantasy, and uh, lit RPG. Um, I now work on a couple of video games, and I have a great amount of fun working with video games and seeing how loot and other things will work, as well as dice. Uh, Chris A. Jackson, I've written, written a lot of tie-in fiction for various gaming companies, uh, Paizo, Catalyst, uh, Privateer Press, Fantasy Flight Games, um, Mongoose Publishing, Traveler is back in the game. <laughs> so yeah, I played that game yeah, in college and now I'm writing short stories for it. How cool is that? Yeah. Um, a lot of other tie-in stuff for other properties too. Uh, I'm also a novelist on the side. I'm kind of a, a hybrid writer. I do a lot of uh, my own stuff in my, in my own world and self-publish it. Um, I am the pirate guy. I have three flavors of pirates. Uh, good, bad, and morally gray. <laughs> uh, my morally gray ones is uh, coming out. Um, the Trilogy is two thirds finished, and it is the Blood Sea Tales set in my own world. Uh, edgy, a little bit sexier, a little bit adulty, but lots of fun. So, come on by. I'm Greg Keys. I've written a fair amount of original fiction, which is how I actually got started in the business. And then um, I've done a lot of licensed work: Star Wars, Babylon Five, Planet of the Apes. Most recently, I did a novelization of the Godzilla King of the Monsters movie. Um, Interstellar Four. and uh, oh a couple of <laughs> that was actually fun. They let me put stuff in there that wasn't in the movie. So, uh, as which is, which is, which is, but it, but it, I've worked on other novelizations and they're like, no, add nothing. Mm. So, Interstellar would be that one. Mm. Um, uh, I guess my gaming stuff is kind of uh, almost a minority of what I've done, but I did do two, two novels for the Elder Scrolls, um, and I did um, uh, one for uh, XCOM. And I'm working on one now, which I unfortunately can't speak about more than I just did. <laughs> <laughs> All you have to say is you're cool. working on something. What? I'm working on a project. Yeah. <laughs> Double secret project. Doesn't matter what the project is, I'm just working on a project. I'm working on several projects. That's just one I can't talk <laughs> yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, there's always several projects. So a lot of this is you're working in other people's IPs. with and. Especially in the case of video games, people know what things look like. How do you go and interpret it back into your novel, or do you even bother? Do you just say, it's a, a orcish or a great axe. You don't need to explain it past that. Um, that that's actually using game terms to describe anything. Mm -hmm. um, is kind of a no-no because you, if you're writing fiction, well, this is what I do anyway. If you're writing fiction, ru using any kind of a game term that is found in the player's handbook or the you know dungeon master's guide or whatever, that breaks them out of the suspension of disbelief of this is a fantasy story set in that world. So yeah, you never you never use the word critical hit. You never use the word cleave. You never use the word. Um, you, you can use things to describe certain items, like a type of, you know, a kepesh sword or a kukri knife, um, but uh, uh, an orcish great axe, because it is an orcish great axe in the, you know, that might break them out. So, yeah, using game lingo in your game tie-in is kind of what I try not to do. I just try to write a really good story and bring things in descriptively. You know, I would describe the axe in a different term, in a different way. You know, big ass axe with a blade a half a foot long and an inch thick with more momentum than <laughs> ten cobalts on a stick. <laughs> I was, my first work was with the Elder Scrolls, uh, in, in, 
that's pertaining to this panel. And they told me very specifically, we do not want to hear the dice rolling, mm. very specifically. And they said, imagine that the world of the Elder Scrolls is a real world. The game is an interpretation. <coughs> it's a way of looking at that world, and your novel will be a different way of looking at that world. And so, um, in turn, you know, so, so specific spells, specific weapons, any of that stuff, um, like, like he was saying, this is... Describe them, but don't name them. Describe them, but don't name them. And, and, but even don't worry too much about whether you're following the same spell mechanics because, it's, again, it's a different iteration of this unknowable real world that's out there somewhere. The only thing I really had to make sure of is, is number of casts, right? So the sorceress could cast this spell so many times. Yeah. And she's, you know, I have all this stuff in my, she's such and such a level, she can cast this spell so many times. So I had to describe the spell, how it's working, how much area of effect it had without actually mentioning the area of effect <laughs> and what it looks like and what it smells like and what it tastes like and all this other stuff. But yeah, not name it. That's a fireball. <laughs> <laughs> I would say um, two things. Um, so with, it depends also on your IP, like how closed in the IP is. Like if you have Star Wars or if you have Elder Scrolls, the uh, canon's there. Um, mm -hmm. That's going to be much more like the specific of here's your boundaries and the boundaries have been reaffirmed. So you can't play with it. Whereas if you're doing like working with someone on a new IP and they haven't developed it before, then you can bend reality almost a little bit and just say, okay, this will be a thing. Um, now, I, I get a, a little bit easier um, job than you guys because when I write little RPG, I can put in there like little stat screens and stuff. And I actually have like, so like the spell will be written out and they'll have like an AOE and stuff, which like definitely makes it easier for me working on that because then. I don't have to explain it because it can, sometimes it can be a lot harder to explain through like this is what's going on for someone that's reading the book and they're not coming from a video game perspective right. they're just mm -hmm. reading them for the book say yeah I mean my experience would be similar to that where you know they know they're playing a game uh, but it's fun to play with because you have these game mechanics that these kids know they're gamer kids but like suddenly they're doing it in like real life and so it's really easy to be a tank like in world of warcraft because you can just get up there and you're fighting the dragon or whatever and you're just whacking it and it's hitting you and you know you're watching your hit points and hoping the healer is you know on task oh, <laughs> but, uh, but um when you're really up against a dragon <laughs> you know as like a 12 year old kid with your sword your she you know a shield that's a different feeling so you know taking like uh, button mashing to a whole nother level when you're bringing it into real life uh, was really fun to play with because being a gamer, what would that be like? Pretty terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, we just we just got an a, uh, a VR system in, at home, and that's the difference. It's like I've played Skyrim up to here for years, oh, yeah. and now I just got a VR system. It's like, holy shit, I actually have to aim my arrows. <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. Archery is just kick ass in VR Skyrim. Do you I, have the, P the PlayStation one? I ha No, I have the uh, Vive Pro. <laughs> I don't know if they have Resident Evil on that one, but good lord, that's scary in VR. <laughs> You're like sneaking around the house and like, Mods. oh, yeah. so freaky. Yeah. Mods are great. So there's and a it, lot of mods for that. And also the thing, like when you're usually playing like with video games and you see like the scale and it's like the screen gets bigger. Yeah. Right. Now when you have like VR, you're just like, and it's how big? It's like yeah. 360 <laughs> by 360, and you get vertigo. You're standing on the edge, looking down off the. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I interrupted. So go ahead. No, no. I believe they're as much here for you. Know, <laughs> yeah, but you get us other. talking, we'll just talk forever. That's <laughs> okay. Can we stay here? <laughs> well, so on to topics of like computer games and various other media. And I might have only just become aware of this, but there's a there seems to be writers that write novels and whatnot being used by companies. Is that a new thing, or has it? always been there, and I've just never realized it. Uh, like, for instance, From Software is, had J.R. Martin working on something with them, and you have something coming out. I'm not going to ask you any specifics about it, but is this a new development? Well, I think uh, Brandon Sanderson. Sanderson had, uh, was the first, yeah, with the Mistborn. Mm -hmm. the Mistborn? Yeah. But the problem was, was uh, there was more issues that was, it wasn't related to the story, it was related to the, the video game that happened then. Um, and that kind of became a cautionary tale for a little bit. Right. Um, I think it's now with more video game companies wanting to explore different things, they're like, okay, well, let's see how we can get like authors to do this. Because 
uh, especially when you have Steam. Steam has become a big thing, and you have board game companies that are, are much more independent, much more open because their uh, company structure is made that way. They can choose and pick uh, more, and they're like looking for people, and they don't necessarily have the um, in-house uh, specialties that uh, old video game companies would have, like older, um, because they're like, oh, these guys do it, these guys do it, and that's fine. They're like, well, who writes a story? Oh. Um, authors write stories, move that, or um, comic book guys, they're doing stories, like, picking and choosing from that, too. And some people, like, um, Blizzard has full-time writers on staff, like Christy Golden, uh, she's a staff member of Blizzard, and she writes the tie-in novels, so it can be a work-for-hire where you're just, you know, hired for this project, or you could be on the team. I don't think that most companies are as, you know, like, evolved with that as Blizzard is, but, um, you know, we've seen, like, we see a lot of um, ads as authors, like, hey, we're looking for people, like, the, I just saw the other day, like, company that makes Dead of Winter and a lot of other games, they're looking for authors to do tie-in novels, so I do think that it's a growing market. It's because a huge market. I get, I, every every year, um, I, I go to Gen Con, I get work. Um, people come to me, you know, because they, they look at my portfolio and, and they know I can, I can produce quickly and, and give them what they want, but, you know, as far as, like, Here's a novel, and we want to make a video game of it. Yeah, um, that is kind of a thing, and and it does happen, but <laughs> that's like for a novelist. Yeah, <laughs> that is like yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so and but I so want VR Dune is what I want. I want to climb on the back of a sandworm and ride across the desert. Oh. That's what I really this want. This is the bucket list item. I have to have. Now I have to have. Who doesn't want to be more deep? Yeah. Yes. I think that idea has been out there for a long time. Yeah. I, I, I can remember, you know, this, as long ago as 97, um, uh, a video game approaching company approaching me about making uh, some of my novels into a game. Uh, unfortunately, never happened. And a little... I guess in the later 90s, 99 or so, I was tapped to write a script for a video game, which also never happened. So the, the idea has already always been there, I think, to, to, for it to move different ways. In terms of hiring authors to write tie-ins, that's been going on for, for a long time. Now, yeah. I mean, Foster, or earlier. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, some video game companies don't mind the unauthorized tie-ins. If you go and look at Minecraft, you look it up on Amazon sometime, oh, there's yeah. thousands and thousands of unauthorized. Fortnite, same thing. You see all these Fortnite... Um, you know, unauthorized stories. My friend writes Minecraft Choose Your Own Adventures. They're super popular. Uh, and she's not working for Minecraft. You know, she doesn't have any affiliation, but they just let them play in the world. And the reason is because they're, you know, it all rises. So more people read about Minecraft than they're going to play the video game. You know, they get more people into the game. Before you do anything like that, make sure that they're okay with it. Oh, yeah. There's because a lot of IPs. Write, like, don't if, you don't mess with If you write a Paizo <laughs> book, I mean, if you write a Pathfinder Tales book and try to sell it and market it yourself, they will come after you with lawyers bigger than yeah. good sellers. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's a new thing, and only a few companies would probably right. accept it. Yeah, yeah. More common that the IPs are you know, locked down. There, there's a lot of IPs out there that are come play in our world, <clears throat> and, and you know, because you're right. You know, a rising tide raises all boats. Um, but uh, a lot of IPs are really jealous about their their IPs because once something gets out there, it becomes canon, right. like we were talking about before. And if you have 50 different writers writing without coordination. In your world, you have all this mishmash of stuff going on. A lot of it's contradictory, so a lot of IPs are very jealous about that because they want they want the timeline and they want the canon right there in front of them all the time. So, how do you deal with company canons when you write? You tell them to send you everything that they have on everything, and then you have to if you don't know it already, you have to mosh through it and make sure you don't don't break anything. <laughs> And be like very like in tune with editors, right? Yes, um, and, and back and forth with editors. Yeah, mm -hmm. and understand you're not going to please everyone every time. <laughs> um, there's always going to if you if you play in a world that's someone else's world, uh, there are fans in that world, and they may not appreciate the direction that you've taken it, and they may let you know about it. <laughs> I've also has to had to turn down work. Um, I I got an offer by a, a company that will remain nameless. And, and their body of work is so massive, and their world is so diverse, and it was something I wasn't intimately familiar with. And, and the learning curve would have, been, would have been months and months for me to just really get into what they wanted, and, and I couldn't get a definitive answer of exactly what they wanted. It was a nebulous thing. 
this. So finally, I just had to pull the pin and say, I, you know, it's not worth my time. Mm -hmm. You know, I have so much work right now. It's like, if I spend three months assimilating your world and delving out of you exactly what you want for, you know, a 5,000 word short story, really? <laughs> I had the good fortune when I was and a lot of the things I've worked on to have more or less direct access to the whoever the creative minds are at at the various companies. So I literally just write and say, "Can I do this? Can I not do this? But what's the answer to this question?" And when you're working with the Elder Scrolls, you know, you've got the Imperial Library, you see massive amount of fan generated stuff as a jumping off point, and then you can you know go go to the creators and ask them, "Is this true?" You know, is this Unofficial Elder Scrolls pages. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just tons of it. Wikis and whatnot. Um, uh, but, but it is intimidating. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about Star Wars. I did three of those books. And um, I knew, I knew, I, you know, one of my favorite reviews I've ever had on Amazon for anything was this guy. So I, I would say, I don't know, some, some percentage, we'll say 40% of people who read my Star Wars book thought they were, maybe, no, no, no. 10% of the people who read my Star Wars books thought they were the best ones ever. And 10% thought they were the worst ones ever. And everybody else is somewhere in the middle, right? Okay. So this this was um, a guy who thought was one of the worst ones ever. And he said, you know, Greg, he should never, ever be allowed to write another one of these things, ever. I'll buy the next one that he's writing. I know he's writing another one. But he shouldn't be allowed to write. I'm like, God, I wish I could get that kind of commitment for my own stuff. You know, like, <laughs> I, you know, I hate this book, but I'm going to buy the next one anyway. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> hate me some more, please. <laughs> hate me and write a review. <laughs> hate me write a review. Give me your money. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah. So how does that fan interaction sometimes play out at, like, conventions, then? Because I'm sure there's Star Wars people, which we're building, are they in, but not here, they're I think in the Marriott? We keep separate from... No. <laughs> I do. <knew. laughs> uh, I guess it would depend, really. Um, it like, if how it's received. Right. Because um, um, you're going to get some stuff, like, in any body of work, that people are like, I really hated this, or I really like this. And then you, you can have people who are like, I'm never going to get this thing ever again. And then book five... That's, that's on book two. In book five, they bought it and put another review of, I'm never going to read any more of this ever again. And you're like, what's going on? Um, it's, it's usually not that bad. Um, I've had a few in-persons that, that found fault with a few things. And I just say, well, I'm sorry. That's kind of just the way I felt things needed to go. Um, and if that doesn't fit with your view of how things should have gone, well, sorry. My editor liked it. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Um, what I found, the, 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 the people I've worked for specifically with gaming, is that they're very, very controlled. So, uh, and this may be different from you guys, but when I was working with the Elder Scrolls, you know, so let's say a normal tie-in book, let's call it Star Wars a normal tie-in book. You know, I, I told what part of the story arc I'm dealing with, I'm told what characters I'm dealing with, or I can propose them, I write some outlines, there's a back and forth, the outline gets refined, Finally, they say, go to work, you've got three months. And then if it's like, say, um, Planet of the Apes, it's the same process, but instead of three months, I've got a month and a half. Um, but with the, with the Elder Scrolls, it was, um, it was there was a back and write us ten small treatments. Okay, ten small treatments. Okay, we like this one, write us, a, a, we like these three, write longer outlines of that. We like this one, write us a longer outline of that. Okay. And then it was like, okay, write the first two chapters. And I've never ever worked like that. And then, hmm. what you your response to that is contract? No, I had a contract. Oh, well, okay. no. But generally, we I have done outlines before contracts, and then once they like the outline, I get a contract. Oh yeah, no, no, I usually get the contract first. But it's this 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 thing. Okay, you write the first two chapters, and so I write the first two chapters, send it off. Months go past. Fortunately, I got other things to do. But it was just really weird, and it, I, I've never. It took longer to write those books than anything else I've ever written, just because of that process yeah. and how controlling they were. So anyway, so what I would say to fans that didn't like the book, if you didn't like it because you don't like the way I use verbs and adjectives, that's my fault. If you didn't like it because of the content, uh, that was vetted pretty thoroughly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, more often than not. 
my thing with writing on any IP, whether it's game related or not, is I I like to introduce like real people, real characters into these worlds and these games, um, and that's my thing. I'm a character writer, character first. And don't get me wrong, I love these settings, or I would not be writing in them. But um, I think, and I've gotten a lot of feedback, positive feedback, both from fans and publishers, that that's what they want. They want a piece of this world with real people in it that readers and fans and gamers can identify with and say, I now I need to roll up that character. <laughs> you know, and, and so that brings people into the game. And so, and that's what I do. Um, as far as the details of the game itself and how much is vetted, that's that's the company's issue. And mm -hmm. whatever they want to do, that's my that's my thing. However, many times you want to edit me on this, so that's great. Now, I have stopped working for IPs because of the editorial process was horrendous. But um, you know that wasn't their fault really or my fault. It's just that we were un incompatible. You know what I mean? Do you two have anything you want to add? Um, yeah, it, it's I, when you're working with something like that. It's I think it goes back to the whole canon thing, right? How establishes the canon? How is it going? Like, if it's taking so long for them to vet the two chapters right away, it's like it's they they have they have to check against so much resources to make sure that it's right. okay. Um, which is so nice when you get to work in your own sandbox. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm making. The well, I would just, I, don't yes. want to really, I, I just want to assert, I think part of it, too, is that the, the process of making games is different. They think yeah. in terms of years. Mm -hmm. We think in terms of weeks, months, maybe. No months. checks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> they think, they, they're thinking about developing things in almost a community process, right. and, and we're used to just, ah, I'm going to write this. I'm sorry. I mean, all I will say is, um, as an author, when you put your art out there, you can't control how other people consume it. You do the yeah, best right. you can, you put out work that you're proud of, and you vet it, and you do everything you can, but once it's out of your hands and it's out there, it's not yours anymore. And someone might actually, like, find more enjoyment hating on something and trolling it, um, you know, than your best fan, like, had reading the book. And so don't, don't worry about how they're consuming it. Just know that you are proud of your work, you're happy with how it is, and, and let it go and move to the next project. Yeah, it, you know, responding to critics in any regard is kind of like you're feeding the trolls, <laughs> you know, so. And I can say that because I had a book that people told me I should be raped, murdered, and crucified because of. Oh, uh, oh the joy. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and it was hard at the time. I was a younger author, and um, luckily I didn't have my child then. I would have been kind of scared at some of the, you know, comments I was getting. But um, at the end of the day, um, I was just like, I can't control this, you know, and I, and I just didn't feed the trolls, and eventually they move on to the next, you know, target that they want to target. And you're not special. They're not, they're just, this is the one they picked for the month. Yep. Uh, and then they're going to move on to something else and be mad about that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, fan is short for fanatic, in case you did not know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you take questions? Or? Yes, actually I was about to, but we're going to move it on early. So, uh, please, who has a question? I, obviously you do, so let's start with you and we'll right. move over. So you've talked a lot about writing books or novels or stories for game universes. Have you ever written for games themselves? As I've written some elements of, of um, game and, supplements. And how would that be different than actually crafting a story for a universe? It's technical writing versus prose. Um, and I made a career out of, out of technical writing before I got into creative writing, really. Um, which is a huge advantage. But um, I, I wrote the whole intro for a Paizo element called Ships of the Inner Sea. And they wanted, you know, the whole body of the entire work was just ship descriptions, stats, blocks, and then des descriptions of the crews and things like that. But the whole intro was, they threw at me, okay, um, give us some creative stuff and then make um, trade routes throughout the whole inner sea of Galarian, and I got to actually draw on their map, how cool was that? Mm -hmm. and, and you know, and I had to assimilate. Oh, you know, here are the trade winds, and here's the what they call these routes and things like that. And here's the dangerous areas, and da da da. And I got to do all that, and then I got to throw out some uh, ship types, you know. Um, and you know, I'm a sailor, so <laughs> yay! 
<laughs> I got to do all that. And uh, and I got a lot of, you know, from, from the whole creative end of the Paizo team. It's like, this is the best part of the whole book. Because it was like, you know, I opened it up. Sales, there's no more adrenaline rush cry that you ever hear at sea because you don't know what those sales are. And here's what the sales look like. And it could be this or that. Or that, 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 that and kind of energize the whole body by throwing something out there at the beginning. And I had a great time doing it. Yeah, a lot of fun. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing I was going to say, uh, how do you guys temper scale when you're writing? Like you can't, you know, move mountains in some, in some things. How do you make a story interesting within those boundaries? I, I think that's also related to the, the world, right? Um, like if you have a world, like if you're, if you're doing a video game to the world, um, then you can be like, okay, what are your spells? How do they work? What's the stats that go with it? And then you can kind of like, it's almost like D&D where you have tier one spells, to tier nine, and then mm -hmm. home crews and all that kind of stuff where you can work from that and you're like, okay, this is my build. This is how the trees would go. And you could basically like paper, like basically D&D campaign out the video game. Um, that de I think definitely helps. Um, because then you can be like, okay, these are my limitations, and you play within those almost, which is pretty fun. I think you need to know the entire world, and maybe in this particular story, your characters aren't going to explore the entire world or you know meet all these limits, but you need to know it as the author. Build the world first if you can, and then throw your characters in and play with it. If you're not convinced, like thoroughly understanding of your world, you throw your characters in, you're like, oh, oh, wait, what should happen now? Where are they going now? That was something I learned when writing Dragon Ops is like, oh, shit, I have to write a whole book and a whole game, you know, and like, and then put the characters into the game. But if I don't have those game mechanics set up in advance, I'm going to run into like a lot of problems as I'm writing the plot line. So yeah, you need to know it as the author. Um, most of the IPs I've worked with have set guidelines for things like that. You, you can't sink any cities, you can't destroy any you know, islands or continents or things like that. And don't kill any heads of state because these are you know, set characters and things like that. So it boils down to a, a, a straight, simple mantra. Small character, big story. So I don't create freaking Elminster, right? I create Torius Vin. He's a fifth level pirate, right? So he's not going to shake the foundations of the earth, but it's going to be a really fun and engrossing story about how this little pirate ship encounters all of these big elements in this massive world. So that's how that's my take on it. So. I think a good uh, example of this in like the sort of real world is Disney World's doing Galaxy's Edge, you know, the Star Wars like section of land. And they're not like, they're not making Tatooine, they're not making right. the Death Star, they're making this new place, Galaxy's Edge, where you might see some of the characters from Star Wars visiting, but this is a new land, and so they can play with it a lot more. You know, oh, the Millennium Falcon's parked here, you can go on and do a ride. But, you know, that's, and so I think that's like a good example of what you're doing, but in real sure. life. Yeah. I was um, told to nuke Morrowind, so... <laughs> Any other questions? But you're just leaving it at that. <laughs> yeah, I know. There is no Morrowind after after uh, after Oblivion. The, yeah, okay. after the red. Yeah, after and red. And I, goes I, it, it was my book in which that was introduced. And it, again, we go back to the fan reactions. Like, who does this guy think he is? It's like, you think I? They had a great time doing it, but like, okay, it, yeah. it was totally sad. actually. It happens off screen. It happens before my book starts. But when they, my characters go there, and it's a, a bubbly wasteland. cauldron wasteland. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. you in front of the pillar. You had oh, your hand up. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, on your projects, have you had any interactions with game design, and what were they? Um, I have. Um, mostly uh, the game team came to me and was like, okay, these are your parameters. Um, but when I was uh, writing, when I'm, well, as I am writing for them, um, the biggest thing that I found is the combat and stuff is external. Um, that, because that's shape your own adventure. Uh, you're just making the, the meeting points almost of the video game. So, like, there's your characters. Um, Text and loot items is incredible pain in the butt. Um, uh, qu and like all, a, a big, big pool of uh, quests. And you basically are populating these things in different corners and places so that when people like are going through it, that through the game mechanics that is there, they touch upon it. It's the one thing you gotta do and like check is like, okay, if there is a story essential part, is it shown in the game mechanics, like can it work with the game mechanics? 
um, like if the because you always have a set storyline usually in video game to video game um, it's how do you do this and not like mess up all the game mechanics and like make, like do the game mechanics and the world work together um, because if you have an incongruency between the two that can be very strange like if you have a knight in shining armor and you're playing like uh, a steampunk less like, not steampunk like a cyberpunk kind of story it's kind of doesn't really work um, like you gotta it's matching things is fun so they change your clothes or not that much um, it changes how you do it it becomes very more much more technical um, because like the, the, the biggest thing that I had to find was how to write it um, in, a, in a format way and I'm still developing that to write it in a way that's not um, like because when you have a book you have like you can write chapter and then start off and then the ellipses and then you're okay, pretty much. Um, when you've got a screenplay, then you've got a whole bunch of uh, different ways to do it. And then when you're doing it like writing in a video game, then you can be using like Excel, which is a pain to use because then you've got like codes next to it to say, this is a character and character one is literally character one. And that's like Toby and then character two, three, four, and there's objects and the interactive things. And it becomes very, very technical on that point. I'm just asking because I am into game design, so I want to learn the other perspective. Nice, yeah. I generally work after the game's already designed, so my answer is no, I don't, and I don't really want to. <laughs> <laughs> Same answer, I've always been hired to be an author. Send yeah. me the rules and I'll write what you want, you know? Um, but yeah, I don't yeah, um, I don't really want to get into changing the rules. The only time I ever had a headbutt with anybody with rules was, was with the... Um, the ship movement rules in Paizo, and it wasn't really even a headbutt. I just emailed my editor and said, "Your ship movement rules suck. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to really take do. this. It's going to, you know, they work great for combat, for the gameplay, but if you extrapolate what, per whatever movement to, and all their ships could move like two nautical miles an hour, which I walk faster than that, <laughs> and it would take months to go from one end of the inner sea to the other. And um, I, I emailed James Sutter about it, and he's and I got the most astounding email from a game designer. He said, I don't usually say this to writers, but in this one instance, fuck the rules. <laughs> Pardon my French guys. But, you know, I was like, I, my work is done, okay. <laughs> you know, okay. I just write the story and, and you know, hand wavy him. Okay, good. We're good. <laughs> Any other questions? Anyone behind the pillar? I don't think there, there is this year. There's one. There is one. One person behind the pillar. Line the <laughs> no question. No question. question. Okay. Just, just okay. stating that there is. They're just there. I kind of have a question for you guys. Um, do you get asked about game mechanics, like as it's going on, like in the reviews and stuff? Because, uh, like, I know you probably get asked about it all the damn time. Um, but like, when you guys are doing it, is it like, hey, I've built out, I've made this build, and people are like, I want to test out this build, and then they're like, I have a question about this, and I have a question about that. Have you? I've gotten a lot of questions on like spell usage because I've played around with a lot of usage of spells for things they really aren't designed for, especially mm. illusions and things. Um, and and I don't know if you guys are gamers, right? <laughs> illusions can be amazingly powerful low-level spells mm -hmm. if they're believed. So the trick in writing things like that and charm spells and things like that is is you don't go into whether or not the subject who's supposed to believe it makes their saving throw or not. You know what I mean? They either do or don't. Or you have a little little wonkiness in mm -hmm. in you know what somebody's seeing, or they'll look at something and blink, and 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 then, uh, then they miss their save on the second roll, and then everything's fine. But yeah, but that's that's my big interaction with with. Things like that is is the, the mechanics of, of especially spells, not so much combat. Combat is combat. Mm -hmm. I think the big balance um, sometimes for lit RPG type uh, you know books uh, is the suspension of disbelief and how much explanation you want to give. Right. So you want people to the the you know the idea of this portal fantasy of like you're going into a video game in some way. How much do you want to be like, this is how it all works, like, you know, let me talk about time compression, let me talk about all the, you know, things mm -hmm. about it, or how much do we want to just, like, fast forward, you know, where does, where does the audience draw that line of, like, this is stupid, this could never happen, to, like, oh my gosh, I'm so engrossed in the story, I don't even care how it happened, 
And so I think that's something we always struggle with. Also with time travel, same kind of deal. It's like, where is the line? Yeah. So when you're writing for an eight to 12 year old audience, they're not going to need like super a lot of science. But at the same time, I know adults are going to read it too, uh, maybe to their kids or whatever. And I want to make sure the world makes sense on some level without going into too much detail to drag down the story. Working with good editors helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you know, those are the people I bounce things off of. And generally, I, I would always bounce things off of before it comes to a head. You know, it's like, can I use this spell right. to do this? Yeah. It's kind of eh. And I think it, well, I don't know about you guys, but uh, plotting becomes very essential for that kind of thing because it, like, you also have, like, the game mechanics, but what is, uh, what have I not accounted for that's right. later on mm -hmm. that might be part of the canon, might be part of your world oh. that you work for? Hey, you know, <laughs> Things like spell effects. Um, there are spells. It, well, I work. I work primarily in the fantasy milieu in Pathfinder. There are spells that will sink a ship just like that. Yeah, I mean, small. bang, uh, disintegrate. Yeah. You know, and I don't want to spoil anything, but playing with that. Why don't these bad guys have ninth level wizards on every ship? <laughs> because they're ex. You know, um, think about, you know, and this is the socioeconomics of magic. And and you know, a little bit of explanium happens, you know, of why the bad guys don't have really high level yeah, because the bad guys can't afford it because magic is expensive, you know, and, and what's the first rule? Kill the wizard first, right? And the wizard's like like a little compensation from being shot at, right? <laughs> so, yeah, if you want a wizard, a high-level wizard on a ship, it's going to cost you $10,000 a day. <gasps> it's expensive. It doesn't look like anyone has any more questions, so I'll just continue asking questions. Or you all can ask questions. I mean, how often do you all actually get to sit down and talk to each other in front of these people <laughs> when they have nothing to pester you about? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, okay, so, like, when you're doing it out of the canon, um, is it, like, how much information, like, of course you're going through it, a massive amount of information, but the parameters and stuff, is when it, have you got ones where it's like, okay, these are brand new characters and all of that, and you're building them into something, and it, there's, like, what effects can we do upon the world? And when it's having that big effect, how does that change the game or the reality? It's like when you're doing Morrowind and you're like, okay, so Morrowind's no longer here. That changes a big set of the uh, video games. So it's, it's actually how the books are affecting the games or like the, the changes in between. Um, like, do you think when that happens that it gets um, like you're becoming part of like a new edition of canon on that part because you're all actually altering it now. Yes and no. I mean, um, so so when I was to have to do that, you know, Oblivion was was out, and a, a huge part of my research for the game, unfortunately, for writing the book, was I had to play Oblivion. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, oh you poor thing. And and, uh, when, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Yeah, and Marwin and uh, and so forth. Um, uh, but they had, they, you know, they were already working on Skyrim at this point, and they already knew, uh, they already had a timeline, and on the timeline it says, this is where Marwin is nuked, and this is why. Mm -hmm. um, this is what happens. And uh, I, what I got to do was pick where on that timeline the story was going to be. And I actually picked relatively soon um, after Oblivion, because it, um, it just seemed like one of the better places to put it, because there's kind of a a time of chaos after that, but um, and then just also in the timeline. So, um, in terms of things that I wrote that ended up uh, in Skyrim, for instance, they're pretty minor because the book, the the the, the game was pretty much done. Mm. I mean, they were they they did include a few sort of references to things that that I suggested and that ended up in my books and that are canon. But they weren't included in Skyrim. Most of them weren't included in Skyrim because the game was already basically done. Right? Um, so how do you deal with like different factions, different races? So you know people are coming into this book. Oh, I'm this. You know, I'm team whatever. Because uh, I know like with World of Warcraft, I look at Christy Golden's books, like I mentioned before, and it's like if you're a Horde or you're Alliance, you're going to go into each book with like a very different perspective. And her 
you know, forcing herself to balance between like, there's no good or evil, you know, they right. hate each other, but you can't be like, Horde is pure evil, and like, how could anyone ever support them? You have to show like the value of Horde, or you have to show the value of Alliance. And um, so how do you do that as in, to make sure every reader gets like an experience based on where they are and where they enter the world? You're asking me specifically, sure. or, or anyone? <laughs> Somebody, I'll, I've got an idea. Of it. Yeah, I kind of work from the hero's perspective, so I do. I I I don't do that. I don't give value to. I, okay, I pick on slavers a lot, um, <laughs> just because I, I the whole idea of slavery is anathema to me. But um, so I I don't think you know. Um, but I kind of had to create a character that was working for the sla slavers indirectly once that she just saw this as legal commerce right so so it is legal therefore it is not good or bad it's legal so we are going to follow the law and the other person is like it's slavery it's evil forget legal it's evil so there was that conflict and it was fun to play with that dynamic of what's legal versus what's good or evil so i think that was my point of view from from character's point of view, and I often have many characters. If you ever read one of my books, there's often five, six, ten, twelve characters, and um, they all have different points of view. And some of them are diametrically opposed, you know. But when I'm in that character, I don't drop in any sort of narration that tells you what I, the author, think about this. I, you, all you learn is what that character specs about it. Um, and um, you know, some of my characters are really, really terrible people, and. Uh, because there's some parts of me that are really terrible. And I can tap into those. <laughs> Writing good villains is key. It's really, fun. It's, it's also fun. horrible. I was on a panel not too long, like the last panel I was on, you know, nobody ever wakes up in the morning and says, I'm evil. Right. Nobody thinks they're evil. Everyone's the hero of their yeah. own story. Right. Mm -hmm. um, also, from video game perspective, uh, the, the good guy and the bad guy slider that you can pick in stories sucks. Uh, and creating that is a, is a huge pain. Um, it's it's so much easier to do than I think than when you're doing the book because you in the book you have to maintain that neutrality by also you have to have protagonist and antagonist right. So you're either a hold or alliance or somewhere in between is really hard to kind of do uh, using the WoW uh, reference. But when you're doing the video game, it's you're doing this is you and it's an anomalous blob and if you do these things then this happens if you do these things this happens the amount of like skill tree things like instead of it being skills though and it's actual like moral choices branches are <laughs> and, degree, and you're just like uh um it is very morally frustrating too when you're like okay is this good? Is this bad? Is this neutral? And how do you measure so that? That's actually one of the biggest things that I've talked to with game developers is how much weight is on each of these actions to say that you're like bad or evil or good in a night. I feel like Fallout Vegas is a really good example mm -hmm. of that, what you're talking about, where you really can go down the dark path and be one of Kaiser's people and like crucify people on the side of the road kind of thing. And like, it was hard for me to do. Like, I played it all the way through as like the good little girl, you know? Uh, and then I was like, no, I'm going to go pure evil this time. It is really hard as a, as a, you know, player to like keep forcing those choices to go down this path that isn't naturally you. So, but it's, it, it's cool that you can. And I think that's what makes it my favorite Fallout video game is because there actually are different choices, real different endings. I feel like I have an agency to pick my path and it changes the game. There's so many games where it's like, oh, you're going to pick your path, but you know, you really, it doesn't matter, you know, and that's, that's so disappointing as a Red, player. Red, green, or blue. Have, uh, most of you are probably <laughs> too old for this, but have you, any of you ever played Undertale? Uh, yeah, 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 a yeah, while. Yeah, I, I, I've got kids. I've got an 11 year old and a 14 year old now. When they were younger, they were playing Undertale, and that's this cutesy little kind of retro game. Uh, and you can play through it um, in, a, in a kind of a cooperative, nice way, or you can kill everybody. And there are different, there's a set of different set of consequences. And it was really interesting as a parent to watch my kids play and try not to say anything and see if they were going to make what I consider the moral choices, mm -hmm. or if they're just going to suspend their ethics because they're in a game world, right? Um, or maybe I didn't teach them proper ethics to begin with. So, um. <laughs> See, my eight-year-old was playing. Well, I was wa my eight-year-old's watching me play Skyrim, and she's like, you know, "I'm on the Assassin's Guild." And I'm like, right. "She's like, what do you have to do?" I'm like, "I have to kill that person." She's like, "Is it a bad person?" I'm like. 
Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe <it's okay. laughs> Actually, I'm just collecting the gold. <laughs> That's a shiny room. You, yeah. you back there, yes. Yeah, um, so a lot of game companies nowadays are really embracing their like Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. is. I know uh, Bethesda has for many years. How is that influencing your writing, or how are you pushing back to influence the company with diversity as authors? I was all over that, like a. A lawyer on a contract. I loved it. I got to write a same-sex relationship in an RPG novel. How cool is that? That is awesome. Yeah, this one right here. And I got major kudos. I got a fan that actually told me that it was the best romance they ever read. <laughs> Male, I mean, same-sex or or yeah. conventional, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I, I was like, scored on that one. Yeah. But yeah, it wasn't simple. I put a lot of angst and problems in there, of course. That's what conflict is about. But yeah, I wrote kissy books, RPG tie-in books, and, and my fans loved it. So that was a win. <laughs> you know, um, yes, kissing happens. <laughs> <laughs> so there's kissing. <laughs> you over there. Okay. So you guys talk a lot about like Pathfinder and like D&D. &D. Do you guys like play as players since you guys like write for a living? Or do you tend to be like, no, I want to take over the table and show you like this interesting take that you've never seen before? I do both. I play and I GM. First of all, it's called research. <laughs> <laughs> so, all of our gaming books are deductible, right? <laughs> I, I know my profession. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I've never, I've never written a book based on, um, you know, paper and pencil RPG, but I, I definitely grew up playing them. Um, and I, you know, played them all through college and I still occasionally pull it out and play with my kids, but mostly I don't have time for that anymore, unfortunately. So, um, uh, and, um, yeah, so I've only written for, for video games, but I, but I think that, uh, if, if you put most fantasy writers, if they tell you they they didn't play role playing games, they're probably lying. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know why they would lie about that, but they're probably lying. I mean, I DM'd when I was uh, you know younger, and that I think that's what made me become a writer, or one of the things because I was constantly making up. I didn't like going by the books, you know, where they give you a. I, I always wanted to make make up my own, and so I'd force my brother and his friends, you know, like, <laughs> and I'm like, here's what we're doing, and luckily they were along for the ride, and and it really helped my creativity and like creating worlds on a very basic level using something that was already set. So I had rules, I had character classes, I had, you know, things I could do. So there were parameters and then I could use my imagination. Whereas I think, and that's sort of like while fan fiction in general is, you know, you people aren't afraid sometimes to start from zero, to create their own characters. They're not ready for that stage. So it's much more comfortable to go into a world they love, that they're familiar with, that they have a starting point. And I think that's a great way to grow as a writer. And you can stay there or you can move forward. Or make and it's in all us if you call it Twilight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, sure. All right. So sometimes when I'm reading a book uh, and I'm like, this is going nowhere, and then I realize, ah, the author was just rolling against a random <coughs> table and he was just writing down whatever the dice dictated him. Uh, so my question is, uh, how do you balance between uh, the hero's journey and uh, rolling dice if you're working with dice? I, I've never rolled a dice once when I was writing a novel. Not once. Okay. Yeah. I don't even roll dice just when I DM. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, well, I, I roll them, but I don't show them to anybody. No. <laughs> yeah, they, I roll all the time. Um, it's, it, it makes it for very strange combat. Um, but it, it's also like you have to pick uh, when to do it I guess is the best thing um, like definitely like because we're working on like a video game like very close video game uh, is, like it's almost the actual video game right there um, so we need a system and we don't have like a, a nice server with all the cool little simulations going on and numbers that are rolling for us so we have to use the dice of course right um, it becomes um, where is it most effective where is it the most uh, if I roll a one, this is gonna really screw up things. And where is it? Okay, like this will add in like a, an extra change that'll be fun. Because um, sometimes you can roll, and it's like this is terrifying now. The new choices that are there, and it's okay if you're doing like panstering on it. If you've plotted it out, it's much harder to do. But then you can still add like risk factors and different things, or like 
say you're getting loot or something, then you can roll for it. And that's a lot easier because then you're like, okay, from these items, I had this stuff plotted out and that's actually going to help me or that's totally useless. I got a pair of stinky socks. Um, like that's, I'm just going to go sell that to the store. So, uh, and, and you just hit, on, hit something on the head right there. Just about every time I've written a tie-in piece for an existing property, I already I have to hand them a pretty detailed outline, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. and, and here's what is going to happen. Now, I, I, I generally write outlines for everything except short stories, but um, rarely do I, I hold to them absolutely adherently. You know, I always kind of fudge things because as the story develops, things happen. But I generally always know where I want to go. I don't always get there the same way. But once that happens, it's kind of like, okay, if the editor doesn't like it, I'll have to change it. But, but yeah, as far as like dice rolls and, and random encounters or something like that, those can be a lot of fun, but I know it's not a random encounter because I know it's going to happen, you know what I mean? And it's there for a reason. It's like mo the rules of combat, <laughs> interesting, the rules of combat and sex are the same. Both have to happen for a reason, and both have to drive the story forward. <laughs> okay. Anyone will want the last question? Otherwise, I'll move on and ask them to do a shameless plug about what's coming up. Shameless. Um, like at DragonCon? No. Like in our life. <laughs> what, what are you working next? on? Be it science, science fiction, fantasy, whatever. Tell us about what you're doing and what we what we <laughs> 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 uh, This is my last book that came out. It's the Camelot Code, the Once and Future Geek. It's a King Arthur time travel. The idea is young King Arthur before he pulls the sword from the stone. Accidentally time travels to our time, and when he's here, he, as you do, Googles himself and finds out his destiny and realizes he doesn't want to sign up for all that. <laughs> so now Merlin, with the help of uh, these two uh, 21st century gamer kids, uh, has to go. the kids have to go back in time and kind of use their gaming smarts to uh, relive Arthurian legend and set history straight. So that's the first one in the series, and the second one comes out next month. It's Geeks in the Holy Grail. <laughs> um, and then I told you about Dragonops, but I'll show my poster because I just got it <laughs> uh, one more time. And this is my augmented reality video game theme park. And that doesn't come out till May, so we get a little ways to And when does the that. theme park come out? Because that's what we all really want. Yeah. Yeah. When do we get to go to the well, theme park? You know, like, I'm like, well, it's with Disney, right? You're just going to add on. <laughs> yeah. They haven't given me any confirmation so cool. on that or any like, conversation there are, at all. There but. are already fully interactive VR, um, like, pseudo-reality yeah. parks out there. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look that's it up. Really She's creating the one for 2024, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. That's yeah. So, totally so like, like hallways you can go through, you know, oh, it pads you can interact with, stuff like that. Because we've it's got VR at home, but... Yeah, yeah. But VR this is, where it is. This not is, not is augmented. So the, the wall's there. Wow. It's actually just a blank wall, and you, but in the in the VR, it's all... This might be a window, yeah. yeah. Dude, that's oh, and cool. they have you things like breezes and mists that hit you and things like that. It's out there. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, the void. Yeah, yeah. That's the next level. I mean, everyone yeah, knows VR cool. now. It's like it's with this mixed reality where you can actually walk through. You know, you can actually hear it. Um, it's experience that augmented virtual. Park. And, yeah. What so, was that? Oh, <laughs> can we go tomorrow? <laughs> um, uh, I am working on books. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on a sci-fi series, I'm writing a fantasy series, and I'm working on a lit RPG series, which is going to take years to finish. Um, it's just getting big. Um, and then it's I'm also working on a video game that's called Dark Envoy, and that is going to be out in 2020, next end of next year. Of course, with video games, what we're doing is it's gonna come out when it's done, yeah. instead of when it's like we put the date on it, because I think that's the better way to do it. And so, so, so you you're not going EA. <laughs> no, no, it's called yeah, it's Doc Envoy. You can find it on Steam right now, uh, but it will be for consoles, and we're looking at doing Switch, but it depends really on the technology. Um, I have brochures of all of my. Uh, in process and past works here. Um, I'm working on edits on the third book of the Let's See Tales novels, which is set in my own world. It is a uh, high fantasy pirate tale. Uh, those are the morally gray pirates. Yeah. <laughs> um, a little bit more adulty, a little bit edgier than the stuff I've written for Paizo. I'm in the middle of a series for Falstaff Press that is urban science fiction, not fantasy. Think genetic manipulation instead of magic. 
Um, Dragons of Boston is the series, and it is so much fun. Automatic weapons and dragons. Yeah, baby. Can um, I buy this? <laughs> yes, you can. Go to um, Falstaff Press, uh, Dragon Moon. Come up, come up, and I have a table in the dealer's room. So A40, I'm up there. Come see me. Buy my shit. Um, I'm also uh, have other works out. I have an agent peddling things to the big six, and I have a book at Bain that is a high uh, that is a um, um, hard hard SF um, genetic ma- manipulation. Um, future where um, they're wiping memories of criminals and making them genetically altered warriors. So, and that's so much fun. I'm a scientist, by the way, I'm a biologist, so I really think genetic manipulation is the <laughs> shit. So, yeah. um, so um, the Godzilla book I just wrote, I've been paid everything I will ever be paid for it. So, uh, I don't get royalties on stuff like that. I get advances, and that's it. However, I would say if you like Godzilla King of Monsters, you should read my book because it's got a lot of extra stuff in it that I talked with the creators about. If you didn't like it, you might still want to try the book because there was a lot of stuff in the original script that made it better that got cut out. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, As always. That made your book. That made it into your book. That made it into my book. Um, the thing I really want you to go buy, though, is uh, if you haven't gotten it already, is a book called The Reign of the Departed which is the first of a trilogy I'm writing called The High and Far Away. And this started out as an attempt to, attempt upon my part to write a young adult novel. And um, it, it took a fairly hard left turn. <laughs> and, uh, while, while I still think, I mean, I read stuff as, uh, I read young adult novels when I was in third grade and I read Robert Heinlein's messy sex stuff when I was in eighth grade. So, um, <laughs> more than that. So I, I, I think in a way it is still a young adult novel, just maybe one the parents shouldn't see. Um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, it begins with this this boy who is um, maybe maybe well, he tried to commit suicide. Uh, it doesn't quite work out, and he w- wakes up in this sort of automaton body, kind of a giant Pinocchio thing that the weird girl in his class has built. <laughs> and it kind of goes downhill from there. But it's a great deal of fun to write, and uh, I'm working on the third one right now, and that's, I'm going to tie it all up. So. Okay. So, one last thing. Be sure to rate us in the app. Tell us what you think of the panel. And have a good con, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. I killed too many